Chiron was discovered in 1977. And it is located between Saturn and Uranus. And it has a very eccentric orbit. So sometimes it goes inside of Saturn, and then it goes outside of Uranus. You know, it's, it, it doesn't have more of that kind of traditional elliptical orbit like the other planets do. So it's, it's more eccentric. And when it was first discovered, it was considered to be a minor planet. And then it, they realized it's more of a comet, but it's classified as both, a minor planet and a comet. I think of it more as a comet. But what's so fascinating about Chiron and the three transpersonal planets of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto was that when each one was discovered, it was in major aspect to Saturn, the planet that makes things real, the planet that gives things form and brings it into consensus reality. So the birth moment of our human awareness of these discoveries of Chiron and the three outer planets was a major aspect to Saturn. Once again, the through and through patterning and the coherence and the intelligence of the universe and this immaculate creativity, that that's happening, right? A correlation between psyche in the human realm and the cosmos, once again, being mirrored, being reflected, even in the discoveries of the planets and of Chiron. So in Greek mythology, Chiron is a centaur, right? And that means that it's a breed of half horse and half human, half man in this case. And usually, um, centaurs are known as being um, wild, right? The animal that's instinctual and wild, um, but also can be very overly indulgent like some of the shadow, shadow side of Sagittarius, which is also a centaur, right? R ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter's sad, uh, shadow side is overindulgence. But Chi uh, Chiron was considered to be civilized and intelligent of the centaurs. And he was known as a noted astrologer and healer, a medicine man horse. Um, <laughs> and an oracle. And Chiron, and this is really important, is also immortal, right? So Chiron never can die. So the reason why Chiron is so interesting to us is because as being a, a healer and a medicine centaur, <laughs> he created these poisons and these elixirs. And one of the stories goes that he was teaching Hercules how to use this poisonous arrow. And when he was there with Hercules, the poisonous arrow that Chiron created the, the concoction himself accidentally fell and the arrow hit him in the thigh. And all of a sudden, he's poisoned. His own poison enters into his body and he is never able thereafter to heal from it. paradox of that, some would say the irony of that, that there is this person that creates these elixirs and is revered as a medicine person, a medicine healer, and yet too much of their own poison goes back into themselves, and now they are wounded for life, unable to ever heal from this wound. The medicine becomes a poison? Yeah, so I'll get there in a minute. No, it's okay. Um, do you have Mercury Uranus? No, you have Mercury Saturn. Uh, yeah, look at it. Well, uh, we'll, ta we'll talk about it. <laughs> What's that? We have the same thing, so it's, I think it's Uranus. Yeah, Mercury Uranus. So you're so, you're, uh, Mercury Uranus can be uh, highly intuitive and quick, and the mind is able to jump to other levels before it's actually come into verbal expression. And so oftentimes, I'll notice with Mercury Uranus people, or like yourself, I'll be about to say something, and it's like the thought form entered you first, and then you speak it before I'm actually there. And you see that all the time with Mercury Uranus people. Um, OK, so, so, okay, so why, why is this so important? Well, we know that Chiron is the archetype of the wounded healer. And so this is where the idea of 
the poison and the medicine being two different sides of the same coin, right? It's about dosage. And that's the idea of pharmacon, right? So a pharmacon is both the elixir, the medicine, and the, the poison, the toxin. And it's our relationship to the substance that determines if it's healing or if it's poisonous. And so at the core of all of life is a chironic or pharmacon essence. That the substance in of itself isn't healing or poisonous, it's our relationship to it that makes it one or the other, right? An interhosting, a symbiotic coming together. It's contextual. So if we remember Prometheus, right, who, which is actually Uranus, right? When we say Uranus, we mean Prometheus. Prometheus stole the fire from the gods on Mount Olympus in a trick, right? And gave humanity fire, gave humanity consciousness, taught us science and the arts and astrology, right? Freed us from being these puppets, these unconscious puppets of the gods. And so Prometheus was punished uh, by Zeus and chained to this rock where then his liver was eaten out every single day. And he was just, you know, sent there to be tortured and to die. But he can't, right? He can't die. So Chiron, realizing that he's never going to be able to heal from this wound, decides to make this sacrifice and offer to take Prometheus' place on the rock and says, you know what? Put me there. I'm immortal. I'm never going to be able to heal from this pain. I might as well be the one chained to the rock. And so Zeus grants the wish, and Chiron takes Prometheus' place. And then eventually Chiron is elevated into the sky, and that's where we get the constellation. So this story, this mythology, can give us insights into the meaning of Chiron, the wounded healer archetype. That Chiron represents our deepest spiritual wounds, that immortal wound that can never heal, that stays raw and open and exposed and vulnerable all the time. Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, right? It's this kind of transpersonal wound that we're carrying through many incarnations. That's, that's the depth of the wound that we're talking about here. And yet, it's by being with this wound that a moral and spiritual wisdom and strength is fortified by going into the depths of the pain and the suffering of Chiron, into this wound. Great powers, great gifts are bestowed upon us. And so it's not only our deepest spiritual wounds and our pain and our suffering on a deep karmic transpersonal level, but it's also the potential source of our greatest capacity to heal, particularly other people. It's a gift that we can give out to others, that we can emanate out from the source of the wound and be a healer. We may overcompensate in this area of our life, right? The compensatory function. If you feel um, like you're not a very smart person, your compensation for that could be to become a very intellectually intellectual person, to become a mastermind that has a wealth of knowledge to compensate for the feeling of inadequacy around your mental capacities. So the compensatory function psychologically is something that is inside of all of us. So we all have our shadow. And usually what's in our persona or what we present to the world is our compensation for what is lying in our shadow. So with Chiron, our deepest wound, we often have this compensatory function to try to kind of master it in some way through lots of 
our own healing work or education. You see this oftentimes with therapists, right? Therapists usually become therapists because they're deeply wounded people who are going to essentially self-combust with their own neurotic nature if they don't find some kind of way to begin to make meaning and sense of it and then allow that to be a gift or service to other people saying I, I understand crazy from the inside out so you know <laughs> let me put this to use um, and so the therapist or uh, the, the medicine person is staying close to the wound it's not about trying to cure it but it's about learning to care for it. And by coming into this relationship of caring with it, we can begin to transform what f was a poison, a toxin, or a wound, and transmute it into a gift, the healing, the medicine. But the only way for it to actually be a living prayer Right? embodied on a cellular level, which is what wisdom is, it has to come from the inside out, through the experience, through the confrontation with your own shadow and the collective shadow, your own personal suffering, your own pain, being in it, in the affect of it, as fully and deeply as you can in a safe container so that you can recover the treasure or the boon that's in that wound and actually be able to share it with humanity. That's the chironic journey. And so often we have to face with Chiron low self-worth and feelings of inadequacy and then learning to rise above these issues by going through them. So there's a certain transcending, but I don't mean transcending as escape. I mean trans as in not only above, but through. And so how do we move through this pain and suffering so that we can transcend it in a way that allows us to come into a relationship with it that's healing instead of poisonous, pharmacon. So oftentimes where Chiron is in our chart, both in the aspects that it makes, but also the sign in the house that it is in, now that we've brought that in today, it's often what we can teach well to others even if we personally have a difficulty giving it to ourselves. So often when you see Chiron in the chart, you have some kind of mastery uh, around being able to share it with other people. It's easy for you to give away the other, the other planets that it's in in some kind of way that feels respectable, admirable, noble, and yet it continues to be this persistent place of difficulty for you to give that same energy to yourself. So you can give the medicine out, but it's very challenging to be able to actually give it to yourself and to receive it. Not impossible, but very difficult. So by the poison that you know went back into Chiron's own body, in his own system, he was forced to learn how to deal with the consequences of it. Right? He, he ate his own medicine, so to speak. And then that forced him from the inside out to learn how to come into relationship with this poison. And then he makes this great sacrifice and says, OK, I'm at going to now go down a Christ-like and bodhisattva path and say, I am now eternally wounded and I am both an eternal being, I'm an immortal, and I am wounded. And I'm going to, those two things are now one. And so how do I live from that place? And essentially, that's just the description of the human being's journey, right? You incarnate from the infinite potential of the all into this little tiny body, and it's a tremendous death. It's a tremendous loss of the infinite potential of yes to this this moment, this body. And so consciousness is traumatic, as one of my Pacifica professors used to say, Alan Combs, he was like, he said, consciousness is traumatic. It's like, yeah, it is. To have self-reflexive capacities 
and to feel separate is fucking traumatic. And the greatest gift we've ever been given. That's Chiron. It's the wound and the gift, right? So it, often Chiron can take this kind of selfless service. Right? In its deepest form, it's about selfless service, but in this kind of paradoxical way where you realize that by being with your own pain and suffering, you're able to share your gifts out with others, which then becomes a living prayer that ripples out into consciousness, and you realize that the other is you. And so the way you heal yourself is by helping to heal others, and not some kind of bypassing way like, oh, now I'm just going to you know, focus all my attention at, at changing all of you. But how can I actually use how I'm, my vocation and my service in the world to help heal you, which helps heal me, which helps heal you, which helps heal heal me? How can I nourish my deep roots to help nourish your deep roots and have it become this reciprocal feedback loop that then ripples out to begin to heal this transpersonal immortal wound? OK, one other point here. Um, so uh, the chironic concept of self-wounding, right, with the arrow going in, into the thigh, um, and the fact that um, it's an immortal, he's immortal, and there's this repetition again. Huh, repetition compulsion, right, is the psychological term for it. So when we um, unconsciously constellate the same situation over and over and over again, but with different uh, characters and in a different setting, but it's the same archetypal theme repeating itself over and over again. Um, like classically, uh, you were abandoned as a child, and so you choose unavailable men who uh, repeatedly abandon you physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually. And it's this repeating pattern that keeps happening. And the compulsion part is not that it just keeps happening, but it seems to become um, larger and larger every time, more dramatic, more pronounced, more exaggerated every time you come back into it. It deepens and expands. And so the psyche and its heuristic nature of trying to heal itself is reconstellating these situations as an opportunity to come into a new relationship with this pattern, right? To move in this phar pharmacon way from it being poisonous and destructive to healing. But if we aren't regulating the dosage of the uh, repetition compulsion and going into the trauma again, we can begin to poison ourselves in self-destructive self and toxic ways because we're getting too much dosage. And so how do we learn to regulate and scale back the dosage so it's just enough to titrate in and out so we can actually assimilate the situation and change the pattern from the inside out? We're talking about a fundamental restructuring of psyche that then comes up through the personality, it comes up through your relationships and how you show up in the world and how the feedback loop between you and reality begins to shift. So the inner changes, then the outer changes. And all of a sudden, you're getting different reflections about who you are at the core of your being because of your ability to shift this repetition compulsion from being toxic, too much dose, to being medicinal. And the medicine then not just transforms you, but it transfigures you. So the actual container changes itself. The temenos, the sacred container or vessel, of you, your being as a soul, actually transfigures in its actual substance material instead of just a transformation, which you know is deep and doesn't imply a death, rebirth, and change, but it's not necessarily a transfiguration, a transmutation of your karma into your dharma. Um, uh, one resource that um, you can read if you want to learn more about Chiron is called Chiron and the Healing Journey by Melanie Reinhardt. As far as I know, that's the place to go. OK, any questions about Chiron before we move on to the notes? Or any thoughts? This repetition compulsion yeah. can be read also by the codex of growth. 
Uh, yes, very good. So Freud came up with repetition compulsion. And um, <laughs> this is fun. So you remember when we learned about the archetypes and we could look at them from many different perspectives? The Freudian instincts, the Darwinian evolutionary uh, yeah, impulse, uh, the Grafian perinatal matrices of the transpersonal domain, um, the, the Jungian I, archetypes, the cycloid. OK, we can look at archetypes from all these different streams, all these different lenses. Um, the same is true with repetition compulsion. So Freud called it repetition compulsion. Uh, Stan calls it coex systems. Um, Rupert Sheldrake calls it morphogenetic fields. You know, it's these repeating patterns, and the more they repeat, the more lines that intersect energetically and create um, uh, a wider and deeper and more intricate fabric. Uh, fabric. A neuroscientist would say, "Oh, the synapses in your brain. Every time you have a thought, you deepen and widen that groove." Repetition, repetition, it deepens, it widens, and all of a sudden, something that just used to be a thought is now a, a belief and a, and a fundamental assumption about life, which then translates into um, not only how you think, but how you act and behave and your attitude, right? Um, so uh, archetypally, astrologically, we call these complexes, right? The archetypal complexes, which you can see in the archetypal combinations that you're born with. So um, Venus Saturn is an archetypal complex. And depending on which dimension of interpretation you're looking at, it could mean many different things. One of them, just staying with this theme, of the broken heart because of the abandonment. The outer abandonment of, let's say, a parent then translates into many Saturn abandonments by lovers. But that could only really happen because there's been an inner abandonment of oneself. You internalize the outer ab abandonment into an inner abandonment, and then you re draw in all these people who abandon you. So that what you can do ultimately is face the inner abandonment that you're doing with yourself. We call those archetypal complexes, which you can see in the chart as archetypal combinations. Or you can see coex systems, the same thing. Um, the per which come out of, in part, the perinatal trauma. Um, so Stan says, OK, you have these experiences in biography. You go back to early childhood. You see an archetypal theme. There's a thread that repeats itself, a repetition. You go back into the perinatal experience. You see the repetition happening in the birth experience. And then you break down below the personal unconscious. You open up into the collective unconscious. And all of a sudden, you have your own previous lifetimes of the same coex system um, that's repeating itself. And then um, you bring in some of Chris Bache in his work with collective karma and uh, morphogenetic fields on a species level. And you realize, oh, it's actually not just my past lives, but it's actually the species karma. It's the species collective ego or psyche um, having these coex systems. And so when I, I incarnate through the solar system, I incarnate through the species collective karma. And then I incarnate through the gender I'm born into collective karma into the ethnicity, into the socioeconomic status, the country, the family, me, my soul, what, what, whatever that might mean. Uh, and then here you are. And you say, oh, here I am. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about. Um, <laughs> Like how this relates, like obviously Chiron can bring up a lot of really difficult content. And um, for example, when anticipating <coughs> transits mm -hmm. that would relate, say like Uranus is going to be going to five degrees with Chiron or something like that. And something that could like you feel into could like bring up a lot of fear and yeah. insecurity. Um, um, in your experience, just how to like maybe some tips or tools how to hold anticipating something like that? Yeah. It's a great question. How to anticipate future transits that you see coming when you now all of a sudden have this perspective where you can have some level of anticipation of what could come? This is really important. Um, a couple things. Uh, in the end of Cosmos and Psyche, Rick talks about observations on future planetary alignments. And he 
gets personal and he shares, you know, when I saw that Saturn and Pluto were going to form an opposition from 2000 to 2004, oh no, I'm sorry, let me back up. When I saw that Saturn and Pluto were going to form a conjunction from 1980 to 84, and I saw that every other time in the 20th century that these two planets came into hard aspect, there was a world war or a major crisis, World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam, uh, the, the founding of the Cold War, uh, and, um, and then 9-11. How do you not go, oh my god, an, an, does this mean another catastrophic war is going to happen? And then it turned out, no, it didn't. You know, everyone thought the Cold War was going to happen, and then it didn't. And you pause in that moment, you stop in your tracks, and you bow down before the mystery, and you're like, whew, what is the nature of an archetype? It's radically indeterminate, creative, multivalent and multidimensional. It's an open universe. And so our participation with it shapes how it's going to be coming through. But it's not just our participation. It's the whole cosmos's participation with it as well, which we can never predict. So when it, we scale it down to our own life, there's a couple of things that can be helpful. One, it can be really helpful to go back and look at when those transits happened in your life already. So you can see this really easily with Saturn. I know you asked about Chiron and Uranus, but let's stay with Saturn. We know that Saturn forms quadrature angles to itself, hard aspects, from 6 to 8, 13 to 15, 20 to 22, and then 28 to 31. Those are the Saturn alignments that we all go through. So we can go back and we can track the narration that's on the narrative that's unfolding, the teleological unfolding of our psyche through time, we can see by tracking past transits and looking at what was happening in our in our lives. And if we can keep a symbolic archetypal eye when looking at that and not get too caught up in the concrete particular of the expression, it can communicate to our soul what it the deeper lessons that we're trying to learn through each of these aspects. And that can help us in the present moment and on the future set the stage of our life to the degree that we can, from the little amount of information that we have access to, to say, OK, I know these types of things happen during this time. And I know that I want to shift the energy. So what can I do to help make that happen? And that requires you getting really honest with yourself about your psychological issues and what you're actually needing to transmute in order to step into a new version of what, that, of what could be possible. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. That, that could be like a good example with a seven year rhythm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah, Saturn is a seven-year rhythm. A lot of relationships don't make it past the seven-year mark. Why? Saturn tests the bonds. And if it's not a strong bond, it's going to end it. You know. Um, so let me give an example here. Ah. OK, I'm going to get personal because it's the best example I know how to give right now. So I'm born with Venus conjunct Saturn. Have I talked about this already? I'm born with Venus conjunct Saturn. My father left when I was three to four years old. So I had a very early abandonment happen. Saturn is the father. Venus can be the little girl, but it's my heart, right? It's love, the principle of love. So my dad left. And then my grand I moved in with my grandfather, my grandmother, my, my mom and I did. And my grandfather, who helped raise me, then died uh, at my Saturn square when I was eight couple weeks after my eighth birthday. And so there's a repetition now of a being abandoned by Saturn figures, men, father figures, authority figures. So I get to the Saturn opposition, and I pretty much leave home around 15 uh, in, in, in most respects. And I start leading this life where I'm searching for daddy in men. And I'm just fucking everyone like crazy. I have no sense of anything being sacred. I have no sense of what love or relationship is because I haven't had a model for it. And I have really low self-esteem, right? I have, I have low self-worth, which is common for the Venus-Saturn complex. And my lack of self-worth ends up creating these situations unconsciously where I'm with men who, who aren't good, right? They're not there. They're not present emotionally, you know? The, 
it's abandonment over and over again. So when Saturn squares, uh, is it squares? When Saturn aspects my Venus, um, I, I decide to get married at 18 as an unconscious attempt to give me some security, some stability. I really want to just feel safe. And, uh, you know, that lasts for about a year and a half because I was 18. And, uh, and at the Saturn square Venus, I uh, get divorced and I move out to San Francisco. And that's when I become uh, an astrologer. And what does that do? That gives me the lens to see my psyche in this new way, which then ethically forces me to acknowledge and honor my shadow and realize, you know, I've got a lot of inner work that I need to do to heal this Venus Saturn complex of the broken hearted little girl who was abandoned by her father so that I stop self-sacrificing my needs and my boundaries for false sense of connection and love. Well, that's all well and said, but how are you going to do that? Well, uh, sacred medicine journeys help, but at the end of the day, those are pretty insular. They in themselves are not enough for us to integrate our experiences into day-to-day -day lived experience, into the patternings of our life. Not in and of themselves, because our unconscious is just that. It's unconscious. It's a blind spot. And we need another person to reflect our blind spots back to us in order to see them. So I entered depth psychotherapy with, an, with a, a therapist, a very gifted, intuitive a therapist who's also an astrologer. And we went into a deep four-year crucible together where I had to actually feel for the first time that genuine split and broken heart. And I mean, really broke it. And by doing that within the safe container of another, I received the gift of the performative modeling of how to be in relationship Every day, Saturn needs routine, every week. And what ends up happening is it forces you to look at the rest of your life because you start to have a healing relationship with someone that's healthy, right? Not toxic anymore, not destructive, but actually healthy and generative. Um, where I start to feel value and love for who I am instead of what I'm doing. Uh, as a daughter of patriarchy, my worth is based upon what do I what I achieve and how well everybody else is doing. It's not based upon my beingness. Well, my therapist starts to help me see that I have value outside of those Saturn patriarchal contexts, and it forces me to look at the rest of my life and go, hmm, these relationships I'm in aren't healthy, and my needs aren't being met, and I'm self-sacrificing for false connection. Well, so what happens when Saturn conjoins my Venus at the beginning of my Saturn return when I have all of this knowledge of only my biographical history, the uh, wisdom of the archetypes and their telos and what they can be in their noble expression, and now I'm in this transit, am I going to look around at my life and re-examine my relationships and how I'm placing my value in what I'm doing? Or am I going to look the other way and then feel the severe consequences of the repetition compulsion happening? Because I'm always one end of the relationship. And if I don't participate in my end, the universe has to overcompensate for my lack of participation. And it's going to create a lot of melodrama in my life to force me to step up and wake up and actually move through the passageway that I've had years of training to not only be able to recognize, but to actually, I've been given the tools now to emotionally deal with these situations that before were threatening. And so I'm given an opportunity in this moment to transmute my karma, my old patternings I'm familiar with, into dharma. And it's the most terrifying thing ever because it's unfamiliar, yet at a certain point you have no choice. And so can you start to set up your life in a way that reflects flex the knowledge that's been given to you so that it becomes embodied, which is wisdom. And the reason why wisdom is better than knowledge is because no one can take it from you. So it's OK to get scared by the transits coming, because it is scary sometimes. But it's the greatest gift that you're also given by the universe is an opportunity to, to have change happen, real change. Thank you for listening and letting me share that. Any other questions before we look at the notes? 
So that's a good segue into the nodes because the nodes are what? Karma and Dharma. 